In this video, I'm going to talk about the most recent game of 2nd edition Warhammer 40k I had against Ed from Minisodes, where my Black Legion faced down his Blood Angels. August 2024. Ed from Minisodes had kindly invited me for a second time to Casa Minisodes for a game of 2nd edition 40k. Of course, when travelling, I always like to explore a little, then treat myself here and there. But the main treat, of course, was seeing Ed for a rematch. Last year, my Ultramarines played his Tyranids, and arose blooded but victorious, true to the narrative Battle for McCrag we were recreating in part. However, for our second game, I wanted to take my Chaos Army for a spin. I have spent much of the year painting them, and they needed to see the table at some point. Before meeting, we hadn't discussed a narrative focus. However, he told me about a paragraph from Codex Chaos, where Abaddon, on one of his Black Crusades, engaged the Blood Angels. We talked about how our game could be part of a Black Crusade, that Abaddon was chalking up kills for some kind of demonic summoning ritual. Naturally, the Sons of Sanguinius weren't about to let that happen, and so we had the setting for our game, a feud between loyalist and traitor, raging across the millennia, boiling up once more in the rubble of a ruined imperial city. I admit I was very excited, yet this is not the first time I have been part of a game of Black Legion vs Blood Angels. Indeed, one of my first games of 2nd edition, almost 30 years ago, saw my Blood Angels go toe-to-toe -to -toe with another chap's chaos forces led by Abaddon. In that game, Abaddon slew my commander Dante in a duel echoing the fight of the respective Primarchs during the Horus Heresy. Only this time, it would be me commanding Abaddon. How the turns have tabled. So this is the army I chose. To start with, there was Abaddon at 275 points, 18% of my points allocation. But I figured he can kill anything in combat. He just has to get there. His army list entry allows for up to four Terminator bodyguards at 204 points. I made sure I took a Reaper autocannon at least, because I was itching to try that out. Now, the rules state I can teleport them into battle at no extra cost, unlike Ultramarines and the like who have to pay an extra cost equal to half of their points. I must admit I was tempted to do this, but I felt the chance of them getting lost in the warp was too high to risk. The other character I took was a Sorcerer Champion, a level 2 Psyker with a mark of Zinch. We kept referring to him as Sindri for a joke. I salute you if you get that reference. A Psyker is basically mandatory when playing with Dark Millennium rules. You can be at a major disadvantage if you don't take one, since, for one thing, it becomes a lot more difficult to nullify Psychic powers if you don't have a Psyker yourself. To fill out the core of my army was a squad of five Chaos Space Marines, three armed with bolters, one with an autocannon, and one with a missile launcher. My plan with these was to give some long-range fire support for my army, take up a vantage point at the back of the board and blaze away. I also had a squad of seven plague marines in case I needed a durable unit to march up the board to take some ground. In support, I had Mr. Tickle, a Chaos Dreadnought armed with a power scourge, twin autocannon, and assault launchers. Owning this particular unit is a childhood dream realised, and I was very keen to try it out. I've been reading about the rules for demons too, so I wanted to bring some of those. The only demons I had painted, and these were not painted by me by the way, were these plague bearers, and they seemed cool anyway. And that is 1500 points of Chaos Space Marines. Before the game, we set up the terrain to look like a ruined city, and Ed has a lovely collection of scenery. It was feeling immersive even before there were any minis on the table. What I valued here was the discussion and even distribution of bunkers and cover and such. It was thematic and mutually agreeable. I particularly liked Ed's decision to break up the Imperial firebase into smaller sections and place them around the city. After we'd set up the terrain, there were a few admin tasks to perform. We opted for strategy cards, and mine were booby traps and insane courage. I was quite smug about the booby traps, and not just because of the name, I figured this was the kind of dirty ploy that the Black Legion would be all over, and I immediately began looking for opportunities to use this card. 
When it came to psychic powers, I had to choose at least one from the Zinch deck, since my sorcerer had a mark of Zinch. Being level 2, he could draw two cards. For the other, I drew from the Adeptus deck and got scanned. A card of niche uses, none of which presented themselves in the game. I suppose it allowed me to look at my opponent's hand of cards, but well, it wasn't as cool as a lightning bolt, let's just say. However, his patron god did bless him with Pink Fire of Zinch, which disappointingly was only a 6 inch range. For mission objectives, Ed drew assassins, which would give him points for killing my characters. I drew Witch Hunt, which meant I had to eliminate his Psyker to obtain victory points. That is, on top of the standard scoring system. So the Librarian was going to be my main target, which was a shame because he was wearing Terminator armor. We'll get back to that double-edged sword later. So now, I'm going to give you my commentary on the highlights of the game. Ed's Battle Report video gives the best account of the events, but here are my thoughts. I decided to have Abaddon and his Terminator bodyguard march up the middle and attempt to engage his Librarian and Terminators in close quarters. If I could get Abaddon in combat, I reckon the game would be mine. Unfortunately, Ed knew that, and had a trump card of multi-melters to counter my plan. In my hubris, I believed Abaddon could tank any shot. In reality, the high AP, high damage stats of a multi-melter mounted on a mobile land speeder was a difficult unit to counter. I beat myself up for allowing Abaddon to be in such a position that he took the hits. Since in 2nd edition, models closest to the shooting unit have to be removed first. And thus, the movement of the land speeder could get into the right position to remove my leader, which of course it did. At least Mr. Tickle, after a turn of stupor, managed to have his vengeance by pumping both barrels of Reaper Auto Cannon into the speeder and blowing it out of the air. This was one of two Reaper Auto Cannons in my army, the other mounted on a Terminator. These are excellent weapons, being able to re roll the sustained fire dice, which can mitigate the risk of a jam. This was very useful on every turn it fired. My issue was, although hits were numerous and successful, the ones versus Ed's Terminators were almost always saved, given the ridiculous save of 3 plus on 2d6. Of course, you can lessen the chances with a high AP weapon, but against conventional arms, Terminator armor really is an incredible source of protection. These rules certainly support the lore of it being durable. Now, I had my own Terminators, and these survived many of Ed's hits too. Notably, two of them set on fire from the land speeder's heavy flamer. You see, one of the fun rules in 2nd edition, and an annoyance as well at times, is the ability of flame weapons to set their targets on fire if they were not killed. Most infantry will run around in a panic when inflamed, and their friends can forfeit a turn to beat off the flames. Terminators though are an exception, they can continue to behave as usual. You need to check at the start of each turn to see if the flames continue or not, and if they do, they will inflict a hit on the one on fire. And while this did happen, the armor save of my Terminators was so good that it didn't kill them. They just continued to walk towards the Blood Angels, unfazed, blazing away. What a lovely image. Indeed, the Terminators eventually charged Ed's Dreadnought, and one managed to inflict significant damage on it with his Power Fist. Had the game gone on for another turn, I'm sure they would have continued to be a thorn in his side. One of my favorite shenanigans was the booby traps from this strategy card. I chose to place it on Ed's death company when they moved on their second turn, and they seemed like a suitably large group to trigger this area effect. This was one of those very silly second edition situations that makes me love the game. One traps counter is triggered by every model within three inches of it. In addition, a two inch blast marker is centered on every trigger in model, so the same model could be hit multiple times. Suffice it to say, there were a lot of dice being rolled. In the end, the wounds weren't as many as I had hoped, and neither was the land speeder affected. So sadly, my hopes were dashed of a speeder crashed in a flurry of boobies. More Death Company may have died, were it not for their 1 plus 1 wound special rule, i.e. they can take a wound and still fight, but they count as dead at the end of the battle, once they lapse out of their horror-obsessed frenzy. Speaking of the land speeder, that thing liquefied my bowels, especially when Ed got out his mug. I knew there was something brewing, and it wasn't a nice English tea. The aroma in the air was the PTSD of skimmers and their pop-up attacks. 
PTSD that is, inflicted on me in my childhood, by my friend and his Eldar Falcon Grav Tank. Stupid thing popping up from behind the hill, couldn't shoot it. <sighs> Thankfully, Ed's multi-melter shot missed during the pop-up, and therefore my breakfast did not pop out prematurely. Well, until the thing melted Abaddon, but let's not retread well worn ground, shall we? Yes, the fortunes of my warriors were few in this game. Though a glimmer of hope arose when my plague bearers were summoned, they got their chance in combat with the Death Company, who must have believed they were Horus, or particularly pointing and disrobed looking Horus. Still, the high weapon skill and deadly plague swords made short work of those frenzied marines. I didn't lose a single combat, and the ability of the swords to ignore armor saves and kill outright on a 4 plus was a hefty boon. Their next target was the Terminators. Of course, the game ended before that could be realized. Indeed, the only casualty Ed's Terminators suffered was due to the psychic power Pink Fire of Zinch, which I cast with the aid of the Warp Card Ultimate Force, so it couldn't be nullified. That was honestly the most my Psyche did all game. Well, apart from nullify Ed's powers. I'd say my Sorcerer fulfilled the comic relief niche, dipping in and out of cover, hiding his cowardly frame, if only to avoid giving more victory points to the Blood Angels. I'd say as well, Ed's unit of scouts was particularly annoying. It infiltrated at the start of the game, and was positioned well to gun down my plague marines with its heavy bolter. That thing got five shots with a sustained fire dice, and with a strength of five and minus two save throw modifier, it was much easier to wound the plague marines, even with their puss-infused bodies. Massive shame they didn't get to use their plague knives up close. And so my Chaos Army's first outing was a loss at the hands of the Blood Angels, and most probably due to my poor skills as a commander. Maybe I should stick to the brush. Regardless, I had an absolute blast of a game, and more importantly, a wonderful time reconnecting with Ed, my hobby friend and inspiration. There really would be no Miniscape without Minisodes. Ed taught me that one doesn't need the best tech to start making YouTube videos. Indeed, he taught me to get the most out of my phone camera and a reasonable microphone. I hope we can play again soon, and the forces of chaos can have their vengeance. Now, Ed doesn't do songs for minisodes like I do, and that's fine. In fact, it's probably for the best. We can't all be an embarrassment to ourselves like I am. So to save Ed the hassle of throwing his dignity in the bin, I've written a song for him. Ready? Now, my mate Ed, I've known for a while, is a handsome chap with a lovely smile, a collector of models, skilled with a brush. The final product looks really lush, but his battle reports are really neat. Tightly edited, a visual treat. Second edition, 40k, will keep that winter boredom at bay. Oh, min. Minisodes, nostalgic content, you love it loads. The finest hobby channel, there's no doubt. That's what it's all about. Hey! I'm Matthew. This has been Miniscape. Take care, and thanks for watching.